Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of sad to to hear about the atomic, you know, going the way that it is. And I know yeah. everybody, you know, bidding goodbye to the atomic and sharing photos of the memories, and even yeah. the mayor, you the, know, Woodfin. Uh, yeah, somebody I was out last night, and my phone had long died, and so I wasn't checking any social media. And somebody ran into me at a restaurant, and they're like, "Did you see the the mayor's post?" And I'm like, "Now my phone's dead." And I didn't see it until like this morning, and I was like, "Whoa!" You about know, when he—that's when I, he came in. He came yeah. in, shook some hands, kissed some babies, and. He just looked at me across the bar. He goes, can I take a photograph with you? I'm like, absolutely, get back here. And then I'm like, when he got back there, I'm like, can we do a shot of whiskey together? And he goes, a small one. You know, that he posted, it was crazy, you know? Blowing up, man. Well, yeah. it's, a, it's a popular place. I yeah, know. you know, and I think just because it, for me, I've had my head in the project the whole time, like morning and night. I've never really had a chance to get that sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never really had it. I mean, I, I've certainly enjoyed it. I've certainly savored it. But these last few weeks... I've never really understood that it meant something to other people. Yeah. You know, it's obviously meant something to me. But, and I was try trying to, these last few weeks, trying to navigate those emotional channels for me in it. And it helped me a little bit to see how many people were also doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that that's been great. Seeing all those people lined up, a guy fucking flew from St. Louis. The place had all week had been full with people from like fucking Memphis and uh, Atlanta and New Orleans and Huntsville and Nashville. But then when that guy showed up and he was like, I flew here from St. Louis, you know, we had a couple there. They, they came in from Atlanta, which isn't that far, but they were gushing about it. They said, yeah, when we heard we got an Airbnb, we came to town and I asked them a few questions. And I said, when was the last time you were here? I assumed that they were here all the time or just recently. And they hadn't been here in, there in three years. Wow. And like somehow something that happened with them in that bar three years ago made them, motivated them to like, drive here get a hotel yeah and they were there both nights friday and saturday that's yeah. awesome yeah well we drove by on friday and definitely wanted to stop by and uh after you'd agreed to do this i was going to swing in and say hey and then we saw the line down the street and we were just like i don't know if we're gonna be able to get in and you yeah. were talking earlier about how long the wait was like an hour and a half you know to get a table or something hour and a half yeah people were waiting like an hour and a half to get a budweiser it's crazy you know and it was, it was just to get one last piece of it before it's gone it, yeah. yeah yeah um uh yeah so it, it was a pretty long lineup. And we've, we've moved ever since COVID to um, seated service. You know, back before COVID, we, um, it was just wide open. Yeah, it seemed you know? like I remember that. I mean, now that yeah. I don't have to worry about the fire marshal, I can tell you that my capacity was 80, and I would stop letting people in at around 160. <laughs> um, and it was brutal. I actually had this little clicker that would turn the light above the doorman from green to red. So right from my well, I could shut the whole thing down by just turning it red. And then when it went green again, he'd let people back in. Mm -hmm. But during COVID, of course, we had to like limit how many people were there. Yeah. So we went down to just seats and then we separated seats. And then once those restrictions sort of softened up a little bit, we, we stayed with that. But the crazy thing is that like our numbers were better with half as many people. We did 20% more in sales with half as many people. And that, and that got my attention, you know? And then one of my waitresses pulled up our reviews um, and on Yelp, let's say. And she pulled up all the one-star reviews. And every one-star review said, great drinks, too crowded, one star. Um, great vibe, too crowded, one star. And there were like nine one-star reviews that just said too crowded. So it never even occurred to me that like people hated that crowd. And so now that we moved to this model, it sort of worked better. You know? Yeah. And it did create a lineup outside, but when people came in, they were happy to have a, they had a seat. Yeah. And I think that, that was more valuable. So, I mean, there's a lot to learn from from the, how we had to pivot and change the model, right? For everything, for trucking, for tennis, for the bar business, you know? Yeah. There's, you know, there's a, a restaurant in town that would never even stoop to doing, um, to go food. They're too fancy. But then they had to, they had no choice, right? And then they were doing something like two or $3,000 a day in, in to go food. So that's $15,000 a week times 52. And they're like, wait a second, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do that. Yeah. You know? So you talking about bamboo, maybe? No, I can't, I'm not going to name it. Uh, okay, well, at, at any point, we loved it. We thought it was the greatest go. thing ever. Yeah. And, and here's the here's the thing that will probably come up is that um, they stopped doing to go not because 
they don't want to do to go, they don't have the manpower. Yeah. I mean, the other day I was in there and somebody next to me, they're like, um, are you guys doing salads again? And she said, yes, we're doing salads. And I was like, why wouldn't you be doing salads? What's the, what's the story? And they're like, they're, they're so short on manpower that they, their person can either make sushi or they, make in, they can make salads. So they have to take salads off the menu. Yeah. So, I mean, what, if you're at the point where you can't make salads, you sure as shit can't do to-go food. Sure, yeah. You know? So that, that's, the, that's the problem. And that's the thing at the end of the day with the Atomic is that we can't staff it. Yeah. And it was, it was happening every day. Are we in the interview right now? Oh, yeah. No, we're okay. rolling. Yeah, no, we're good. Yeah, well, listen, then I should probably pour you a sex band. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah, hook me up. Um, okay. But, yeah, I, I kind of dig the idea about, um, yeah, having a having a seat when you go in there because, you yeah. know, I always wanted to sit in the jungle room. That was, like, our favorite place to hang out. And uh, it was always such a bummer, man, when you go in there and it's super crowded and yeah. there's nowhere to sit, standing room only, and trying to fight for a place at the bar. So I could understand how... Right. Yeah. Maybe waiting a little bit longer, but then getting a seat once you're in and being able to enjoy yourself. Yeah. How that model might work a little better. Listen, ticket you know? times were quicker. You don't have to uh, navigate a crowd to get the trays to there. Um, and people just enjoy more. There's nobody lurking there trying to get that seat from you, you know? Yeah. Uh, at the bar, there's not like somebody pressing up against your Yeah, dude. Like just all around yeah. it. You know, because it, it was pretty messy. Um, this is where I'm going to flame an orange peel. Well, thank you, sir, for actually doing this. I think the drinks that I would have offered you when you said, hey, can I bring booze? I was like, absolutely, because well, I have a little mini fridge back here that we just stock full of uh, cheap beer. What, so. I, what I brought for myself <laughs> is the, the thing I normally drink, which is a whiskey and Coke. Okay. Well, either way, man, this looks awesome. Um, let's see this thing flame up. All right. Woo, son. Okay. And then I'm making two. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we got to have a one. So you are a true mixologist. I've been kind of reading up about you, your your career and all the things you've done and, and really cool. And I, I'd love to hear about like just – thank you, sir. We'll do tattoos later. Got to do the tattoos. The classic Sex Panther tattoos. Um, I wouldn't use the word mixologist. I think there's just bartenders and there's bartenders that know how to make different drinks. Okay. You know? I mean, I think the best bartenders are – bartenders i think every cocktail bar that i've been to anything with a name anything celebrated i've always hated it you know um i just think that there's more to it than than that the experience you know the the drink is one part of it and a lot of mixologists just know that part okay you know everything else is is the real energy of of bartending of the meat of bartending so, I mean, it, you know, my favorite bartenders in town work at the Nick. They work at the Brown Derby. Um, places that are just sort of regular places where they, they remember what you drink. They sort of like more interested in, in you are. And sure, I think, yeah. I think, it's I think it's fine to sort of like to care about a cocktail and ingredients and stuff like that, you know. But I think when we start fetishizing those spirits and those liquors, then I think we've lost the point a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. No, I get that, man. That's mm -hmm. why a lot of places like that, you go in there, you're just, it's almost like you're just hanging with your friends, even if you're flying solo, you know, like the bartender knows you, the bartender and it's more interesting you. in just talking yeah. and hanging yeah. out, and not so much And about every other like, cocktail bar I've been there, like, they're just there to sort of like, the focus is on the bartender, mm -hmm. you know, and the focus should never be on the bartender. The focus should always be on the on the, on the customer, on the seats, you know? That's why, yeah. like, I name my drinks after after the customers. Yeah. That's why the, the, pic, the pictures on the wall are of the people. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy if you like the drink. I'm happy to tell you about the ingredients of the drink. But I'd rather tell you about the person that the drink is named after. Yeah. In fact, that person is probably sitting right next to you. That and is cool. Make, and, you know, and I have a policy that if you order like an Elliot Potter and Elliot Potter's in the bar at that point, Elliot Potter serves you the drink. I, he, gets up from his oh, table, really? he gets up from his table. He takes uh, a tray. He brings it to your table. I introduce you to the person that, you know. Well, I never had Randall Porter bring me a, a Randall Porter well, before, but I'm, that would have been cool. Yeah, I'm going to organize. He'll, he'll, he'll be there when, when you see him. Okay. Yeah. And the thing is, like, you, maybe you'll take a, the takeaway you'll have is the drink was delicious. But what's really more important is that you met Randall Porter. And mm -hmm. you're going to see him at Trim Tab, and you're going to see him at the Pizzitz or something, you know. And then that connection from that bar will make a second and third and fourth connections. Yeah. And then Randall Porter will come on the show. Sweet. That'd be cool. Absolutely. Welcome to come on. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'll take it. Well, dude, uh, 
How did the atomic get started? Where did the idea come from? The atomic. There's a lot to dig into, but like I mean, I, th I think I did pretty much hit the ground running. And then the thing about Birmingham that I love that I'm still here like 15 years later is that it's so comfortable. It, you feel like a, a local like the day you arrive. You know, everybody knows everybody. It's one of these towns. Like this past year, I went to Tulsa, and before that, I went to Laramie. All these really small towns. And what I loved about them is that we were we we were locals. Like the first afternoon we got there, you know, we shot pool. We were found a pool hall. And these two girls were playing pool, these ladies. And um, we told them where we were staying in the hotel. And they said, oh, there's a diner right there next door. My, my daughter works there. The next morning, we went to have uh, breakfast there, and she waited on us, you know. We sent her pictures of her mom. And, like, we were regulars that day. We were meeting people that, that for, like, lunch the next day, you know, that we'd met, like, playing pool the day before. And it's, cool. it, it sounds like that that are just... Full of these people that grew up here, they may have moved somewhere else, but then they realized that they wanted to come back to this town. And then they come back to this town and they invest in this town. Like their time, their money, their friendships. So they, and that makes things like the bamboo or the blue monkey or Cosmos pizza, you know? Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of chains and stuff like that. And the person that serves you your drink or the person that brought you your meal is the owner of that place. They may have cooked it, you know? And I, I like towns like that. When I arrived here, this was that town. Um, I was broke. I was staying on a friend's couch because it was Katrina. I mean, I didn't bring anything with me. Um, I went for brunch where she worked. The bartender there gave me some of her shifts so I would have money in my pocket, you know, which is really amazing. Yeah. Uh, Frank Stitt, who was like the number one restaurant in, restaurateur in town, and I didn't know who he was, he offered me a job, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, so I had and, and so I had like three jobs when I, when I started. There was a girl that I met at a bar at the Nick, and I told her about how I, I arrived here with um, – just the clothes on my back because I thought I was going right back to New Orleans, you know? I had my phone, no charger, laptop, no charger, clothes on my back. You weren't planning to stay. I was not planning to stay. That summer, we had a bit of um, hurricane fatigue because like four or five hurricanes sure. had, had come towards uh, New Orleans. We'd evacuated, and at the last minute, it had veered off, you know? Uh, I didn't escape for the last one, and it was sunny and 75 degrees the day the hurricane was supposed to make landfall. And I had the city all to myself because people had just evacuated. So I really just thought it was going to be the same thing. And so I didn't bring anything. So like a couple of days later, I was like just doing laundry of just one set of clothes. And then I told that to this person. The next day they came back with a gift certificate to the summit for $200 so I could buy clothes. A stranger. You know, so I mean my time in this town, when you set the bar at that level. Yeah. I was just like, oh, this is amazing. This is awesome. This is yeah. awesome. What a great town. What That's great so people, cool. You know? So I just sort of worked my way from bar to bar to bar. Like, I mean, not – Bar to bar to bar, but like, you know, three years here, two years there. And working at like the Oasis, which was just a great juke joint. Yeah. Um, I worked with Frank, of course, for about a year. Um, places like Ocean, which were wonderful. And, and the owner of Ocean, a guy named George Rice, he turned over his bar to me. And that was the first time I just had a bar all to myself that I could do whatever I wanted with, you know? <sighs> pressure. Yeah, that was a lot of pressure. <laughs> too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the bar really wasn't at, at this. We're talking about like seven, eight years ago, nine yeah. years ago. So the bar was set at um, vodka and orange juice. So anything you did that was more complicated than vodka and orange juice, you're going to get somebody's attention. Man, I've always been so intimidated, man. I couldn't. I've got a lot of friends that are bartenders. I myself have never done it, and I always make the joke that when uh, Mom's Basement first opened, yeah, they were strictly that's beer, true. and I could crack open beers. But this whole, you know, making drinks and stuff. I don't well, know. Facebook is good with memories, right? So this week, Facebook memories said ten years ago today, you were in Las Vegas. Um, I. Entered my first cocktail competition. It was a regional one, right? So you, every state does one. Mm -hmm. And the winner of that state goes to Vegas to compete for the, the, the big prize. And I won my first competition ever. It was in Birmingham. Oh, I read about that. Yeah, that was the, it was, it was like the Saf GQ, Saf GQ, GQ thing. Yeah, crazy. okay. I, yeah, so I ended up in an episode, in a, in an issue of GQ. Dude, that's crazy. awesome. It was crazy. So how do you do that? How do you win that contest? Well, I mean, I, I kind of got lucky, I guess. I mean, here I just came... At the time, I was working at Hot and Hot, you know? Okay. And so the thing about Hot and Hot, a place like that, is that you can go into that walking cooler and everything is there. You know, there was sumac there. And I'm like, well, what the fuck is sumac? So well, Sumac is Right. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to just sort of like wing it and put together something that was like whimsical enough that it got their attention, you know? Um, but then I I get to Vegas and I got my ass kicked. Like really? It was, yeah, yeah. I think the judge laughed out loud at me. Wow. Yeah, it was Man, pretty terrible. That's crushing. It was terrible because, like, they had, like, it was really terrible because they had a series of judges, and they were just sort of going from bartender to bartender judging them. And I ended up with this really young British guy and another guy who was just drunk out of his mind, and he saw that I was using sumac. He goes, 
I have a sumac tree. I can't wait to taste this drink. It's going to be amazing. You're like, so Great. I was just like, <laughs> okay, good. And then a girl with a clipboard comes up, goes, hey, you guys are at the wrong bartender. This is your bartender over here. And I'm just like, wait, what's happening right now? And they go, he goes, I'll come back and try it later. No, I need the sumac tree guy. I, I need him. Guy. I need that guy. I need the, the young guy who's just here to get laid. Yeah. He goes to the, this next guy next to me. And as I turn back, my judges have showed up. Now, listen, Tony Abu Ganem is my judge. Tony Abu Ganem is the keynote speaker the next day. He is the Frank Sinatra of this business. The guy next to him is this Vin Diesel looking guy who won the competition last year. And I was Steve. just like, oh, this is the worst. Um, I That's placed, tough, man. I placed 50 out of 50. 50 out of 50. 50 out of 50. Oh, man. Yeah. And it's funny that, that this is the 10 year anniversary of it, where, you know, 10 years later, you know, I have three James Beard nominations, you know? There's a two hour wait to get in the bar. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it does give me a little bit of closure for this, this whole sort of arc. Well, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. I got to start somewhere. It was good that I ended up last. You were at least at that level to even be invited in the first place. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. 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 It, it was a good window into the business. And I don't know that it was a good window into the business because I absolutely hated it. You mm. know, everybody there was like, you know, they were just like cartoon, like Portlandia characters. You yeah. Know? Just I was like, about to ask if you'd saw that skit of uh, yeah. the mixologist. The mixologist. That was pretty he, funny. He takes like 25 minutes to make it. Yeah, like, man. So banana peels. He's just throwing like, stuff. <laughs> eggs in there, eggshells in oh, there. Oh, man. I love that shit. Yeah, so and, the, and the two characters are just like, oh, he really must like oh, me. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So sexy. So great. So yeah. sexy. And uh, it was those guys, and they were just kind of la laughing. Like real them. life. They, were, they really just took themselves very seriously, you know? So you try to sep your, separate yourself away from that. I guess that's I, when you, when you say I, I don't like the term mixologist. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I get guys that. Are kind of dicks. No, I get it. That's yeah. cool. That's yeah. awesome. A good, give me a good bartender anytime. I'll be happy. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so. You're working at Ocean. Uh, they turn over the bar to you. Mm -hmm. um, how long are you there? I'm there about three or four years. Okay. Um, and you know it gets kind of old for me. Sure. And then so I get a job at a dive bar. I've always had three jobs at a time, so I generally work like nine shifts a week. Um, I think I worked at Cafe DuPont after that, which was fine dining, which is great because he, he turned that bar over to me too. Um, and then I think I went to Hot and Hot, and then I left Hot and Hot to go help open what would become the Collins Bar. Collins Bar. Now, when it first opened, it wasn't Collins Bar. It wasn't. It was something called the Metro Bar. Metro Bar. Okay, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. it was a di it was a dive. It had its heyday like in two thousand five and two thousand ten, and then it sold to a guy who wasn't in the business and he didn't know what he was doing, so he ran it into the ground. Okay. And then, I mean, which which happens a lot, right? Yeah. Which is why, why we have uh, TV shows like Bar Rescue. Sure. Right? Restaurants, um, anything. Yeah. Restaurants. I mean, they go they go out of business. Come and go. Than, yeah, it's crazy. You know, nine out of ten of them go out of business, especially when you have somebody that isn't in the business, you know? Yeah. And then it was bought up by Andrew Collins. Andrew Collins also didn't come from that background, so he hired me to sort of be the bar part of it. I um, mean, he had a guy who was going to design it for him. Um, it had a whole different vibe. It was going to be like a nightclub. Mm. Um Things didn't work out with his designer, so like it took several months, and eventually, I suggested I would design it. So I ended up designing the Collins Bar and building it. You just have a knack for that kind of thing. I, guess. I mean, because like if you're like a musician, you have had the first twelve songs on your album ready your whole life, right? Yeah. So I mean, if you're a bartender, I mean, you've had your bar in your head your whole life. You know, it just happened that it was somebody else's bar that I was making my. But bar. they gave you the freedom to actually that, explore that. Freedom that. to do it. Yeah, that's sick. That's awesome. So. Um, you've been in the Collins Bar? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so you're aware of all the paper planes that are up there? Yeah, the paper planes, well, periodic yeah, table so in the so back. The, that's the cool. paper planes is something that I've been doing for about like 20 years. It's a part of a large-scale installation piece called You Are Falling to Earth. Okay. You know, it, it's, it speaks to sort of like uh, people and they're how, like a paper airplane. You're, you have a, a loft period where you're launched and you peak. And then at some point, your the nose of your paper airplane ends up in the ground, kind of like people. You know, we're a loft for different amounts of time, but we all end up in the ground. So that's what that piece was. That's cool. Yeah. But it was just meant to give some texture to it and make it kind of cool. Yeah. I've been working on that periodic table for, for some time. Um, and then eventually, you know, I mean, I needed to own a bar because I did not own that one. I had ownership of it, but I did not own it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Sure. I, 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 I was in the bones of everything. Every song that you heard play, I picked it. Um, the periodic table, I had created it. The paper airplanes, I had the story to tell about it. The cocktails, I was coming up with them. So... I did not own it. And, you know, that's that's a tough thing to have. So I left. At that point, I'd met my my girlfriend at the time, but then my future wife. Um, so we left together, and we decided that we were going to open up our own place. Dude. And then we did, like a year later. That's awesome. Well, it was about uh, six months. No, it was a year later because we just couldn't find anything. 
Mm. It was at that point, like six years ago, there was nothing available. Now there's a ton of stuff available. Now, did you know when you left what it was going to end up becoming the Atomic Lounge, or was it no, like an a, ever evolving? No, I mean, I was terrified because I had pretty much used all my good ideas on that first bar. You know, I mean, you <laughs> just tapped get, out. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think they call that the sophomore slump. That's why yeah. everybody's second record sucks. Yeah. Um, so we just sort of like put our head down and like a lot of things just did whatever, like one day after another and came up with ideas as, as, as we went. Did you visit other bars that may have inspired you in some way or another? No. You know, when I visit other bars, the only thing they do to inspire me is to show me no, what not to do. What not to do. What not to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, no. I mean, uh, the Sgt. Pepper thing I had sort of had mulling around because I wanted something that also was dynamic and that was recognizable by a lot of people and that I could somehow make some sort of atomic thing or um, Birmingham thing out of it, you know? The four Beatles could represent the four elements of Birmingham, um, food, music, politics, and sports, you know? So it lent itself to sort of like celebrate Birmingham. Um, and I think the thing with the drinks being named after people, that sort of came up like two days before we opened. Even the costume thing, like we, we got married just before um, we signed the lease, maybe that same week, and then we started building it. And it was, you know, we were kind of broke. We only had enough money, let's say, to make this, you know? And so we didn't have a big wedding. But towards the end of the build-out, we're like, we've got a little bit of extra money. We could probably spend about like $1,000 to, to have a wedding. And a lot of my buddies had not been to that wedding. So we decided to fly to Las Vegas. And yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? <laughs> it would be real cheap, you know, because, I mean, you just a flight there. The hotels were cheap. We could get, a, we could get married at Graceland Chapel by an Elvis in person. Oh, yeah, got to have the Elvis you know, guy. We'd yeah. go the whole way. And then, you know, I had seven of my friends. And I'm like, well, what if we all dressed up as Elvis? And what if my wife... Um, dressed up as Priscilla. And so I had two bags. I had a bag full of my clothes and then a bag full of seven costumes of Elvis Presley. Elvis costumes. Yeah. Where do you get Elvis costumes? It's just the internet, party, party, I guess. Party City. Party City. You know, but okay. they only have like one or two on, on the show. I need seven. <laughs> so I had to go to like three party party cities. I get them, you know? That's funny. Glasses and also the day of the wedding, we just all put on these costumes and we walked out into the streets of Vegas. And I mean, traffic stopped. It was really great. Like, I mean, we went to a bar. People would buy us their drinks. We had dinner before the before the wedding, and people were just sitting down at our table, and they're like, "What's the story about the, the costumes?" And then they tell us about how they knew Elvis. Right? Is this a TV show? What is this? Yeah, yeah. what is it? You know, but it was funny because it broke down all these barriers that you normally have of strangers. Sure, like because especially in a crowded city like that. Especially in a crowded city like that, for sure. Yeah. And you know, uh, uh, my friend Heather, who was there, she would like wander off, and I'd be like, "Shit, I gotta find Heather." But when I find Heather, she'd have like eight people around her, you know, because they would come to her and they'd ask her about it. By the time I got there, they'd already finished sort of the regular questions of why are you dressed as Elvis. But now they're talking about, like, where is she from? They'd be talking about their kids and their kids play soccer. Now they'd be talking about soccer, you know. Um, you can make any friends with, as long as you're dressed as, as Elvis. As long as you're dressed as Elvis, right. Yeah. The whole world opens up, opens up to you. Right. I mean, you know, every all the guys that were on the, the trip um, were married. So, but... Girls were coming up and taking their pictures with them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they were giving them their phone numbers, which they're immediately throwing away. But it was a very interesting thing because, you know, in a bar, if you just stepped into a bar and girls started giving you your phone, your phone numbers, you're like, wait a second, you know? That's why I'm here. This is great. But so it, at, the next day, as, the, as everybody was flying out of Vegas, they were texting me. They were like, why is nobody buying my drinks right now? Why is nobody taking my picture? <laughs> Why are no girls sitting in my lap right now? And I just, I'm not famous anymore. I'm not famous anymore. I looked at that pile of, of Elvis costumes. I'm like, it was the costumes. Yeah. Yeah. You're just a person now. And so, and so I thought to myself, I'm like, well, what if we had just like these six Elvis costumes at the bar? Like maybe there's one guy at the table who will put it on. And we did it. And it wasn't one guy. It was all six people at that table. And then the people at the table next door, they're like, wait, how do we get costumes? And so, like, a week later... The we birth had, of the costumes. Yeah. yeah, and so I think a lot of it wasn't... Like, a lot of good and great things, you're not really planning it. It's sure. Just, it's organic. It happens, yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, a week later, we had 12 costumes, and six weeks later, we had 13 costumes, and, like, a year later, we had 50 costumes. And then there was a wait to get costumes. That's crazy. Yeah. And it was really great because it was just a thing that was organic, and you never really predicted it. And it, every day you learned something new about it. Like I would get a, a wolf costume, but you couldn't see the person's face, and so nobody would like it because you have to take a picture of it, you know? You couldn't drink out of it. Um, so we were learning as we went, you know? Get costumes it, that it's kind, you could see yeah, their face. It's kind of uncharted so. territory. Um, no human costumes. 
So you couldn't be Indiana Jones. My Spider-Man costume, nobody wanted to wear because it was too much like them. Right. They wanted the squirrel. Yeah. They wanted the parrot. I think Katie wanted the squirrel one time we were there. She's like, I want the squirrel. It's the most popular one for yeah. two because it's the most over the top. Over one. the top, yeah. And what was really interesting was that like 22-year-old frat dude was putting it on. 59-year-old mom was wearing it, you know? It bridges all it gaps. Bridges all, yeah, and it was crazy just to see how that costume stripped away everything else. There was a table full of, like, doctors who wore costumes. There was a table full of um, skateboarders wearing costumes. They saw each other, and they sat at that same table. And they were laughing. They, were, they left together, you know? And it was funny because they would never do that if those costumes were, on, were not. Yeah. There was one guy who was on a date, and he was a banana. And he looked over, and he could see in the living room – just the top of another banana. And he said, he, he said to me, <laughs> I got to find the other banana. Girlfriend, I'll be right back. <laughs> he walked up there. I watched it. He walked up there. He just stood there. And it was almost like these two bananas had been pulled from the same bunch like earlier in their lives. And they were now reunited. I mean, they were sending each other shots. They were taking pictures together. They left together. You know, right. I'm sure I'm sure one banana is the other best best man at the other one's wedding. Oh, uh, sure. You yeah. know? Bringing bananas together. Right, right. And they were like, how do we meet? Oh, we were both bananas there, you know? So we, we, there was no way, there's no way to plan that. Yeah. You know, there's no way to foresee that. But we had a lot of lucky accidents on the way to it um, that, that got us to, to where we were and were able to set ourselves apart. When you originally started, the decor, that's probably the coolest part. You know, I loved going in there and sitting down and just all the cool things. You had the bubble machine and, yeah. you know, you go into the jungle room and there's actually uh, a sound machine. Yeah, and it, it sounds like you're in the texture, jungle. Yeah. So uh, it really did feel like every room or area was like set apart from the rest of the bar. It was just so cool, man. I yeah, thought it was very I think well the success of a place like that is that a lot of places, and again, I won't name names, they're one thing. They're yeah. one thing from the time you start to the time you end. That bar has so much texture to it that no experience is the same every 10 feet. You yeah. know? Like I have bubble machines unique to tables <laughs> so that like this table has – just full of bubbles, but the table right next door has no idea that there are bubbles happening next door, you know? Did you know you had to have bubble machines from I, the beginning? Again, you know, it's such a lucky thing that, like, on year two, I put one bubble machine out um, in one booth, and I just saw the reaction of those people. And then, like, that New Year's Eve, I'm like, what if we just filled the place with it? So I bought 11 bubble machines, put them in the rafters, and I already had them there because I was going to plan them for, like, midnight, right? At one use, and I already had them there. Bubbles. So just on command, yeah. just bubbles, you know, and people really enjoyed it. And, you know, you co you control them from this, like, little, like, almost like a... Were you doing that, or was it on a it's timer? Me. It's so me. it was just you, you're like, all right, time for some bubbles. Yeah, <laughs> you just it, hit it. You came to my, my belt. Because <laughs> that always, it's like everybody would stop their conversations. They're yeah. like, oh, the yeah. bubbles are coming down. Yeah, and as soon as, like, somebody so came funny. in, that would be the first thing. Or every now and then it would happen. And um, what's really great is that when people are like, how does it work? And I would just take it off my loop and I'd hand it to them. I'm like, top button turns it on, bottom button turns it off. Mm. And I would just give it to them. And that person was just like, wait, I can control I'm the I'm in bubbles. control of the bubbles? Oh, yeah. dude. That's so cool. Yeah. So, like, I mean, every now and then you can have that person leave that, that experience with, like, I have this knowledge. I turned on the bubbles at this place, you know? And oh, I yeah, you have to be part of it. You have to be part of it. Yeah, yeah, once you have ownership of something, you know, my favorite bar in New Orleans uh, one day I was drinking there, and they were changing out the jukebox. And he was just putting fresh CDs into the jukebox. So I'm dating myself a little bit, so it's like obviously this is like 1992. Um, People I, still have jukeboxes. Come on. And I asked him, I'm like, how does how does one get their their CDs into that jukebox? He goes, you give them to me. And I lived like a block away. I'm like, I'll be right back. And I went and got my five favorite CDs. I gave them to him. He put them in that jukebox. Why would I go anywhere else? Yeah. You know, all my favorite CDs are on the jukebox at this bar. That's cool. And when somebody played that song, which let's say it was something obscure, um, I'm now connected to whoever played that song. Like I'd look at the person standing and picking. I'm like, you are also a fan of, you know, the replacements, let's say. You know? Yeah. So I think that once you have that that ownership, mm -hmm. I think that's what – Or you know doing. some of the secrets or something. Or, yeah, or you've had like this one intimate moment yeah. with like, you know, that thing. Like, you know, I, I let people come behind the bar all the time. Not to necessarily make their own like last word or – a cocktail on the menu, but a bourbon and coke, go ahead. Pour a shot, get yeah. back there. How That's, hard could it be? It's liquid in a glass. Yeah. You know? And that takes the the mystique off of it. And if they're there with a friend and they come out of the bathroom and their friend is behind the bar, they're like, wait, what just happened? Yeah. Because in any other bar that gets you kicked out. Oh, for sure. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that line, I get why it's there because there's a lot of people who shouldn't be behind the bar. But once you've sort of, you can suss out a person, you know? 
And once you blur that line, you blur every other line, you know? Why would you go anywhere else if, if you can come behind the bar at this bar? Yeah, I think that definitely um, connected with a lot of people. And there's a reason why so many people this week have been sharing all their stories and photos yeah. and over the years and just hanging out there and all the memories that they've had yeah, you know, yeah, at your I, bar, which is really cool. Yeah, and I, I was one of my favorite things is how many people met their girlfriend there. Like, not just like I went to a bar and met them, like their first date was there. Mm -hmm. And they're getting married this, this summer. Or they are married already, yeah. you know? And they reached out to me. They're like, hey, our first date was in the jungle room. Is there any chance I could have one of those lava lamps, you know, as a memory of our first date? Yeah. You know? So, of course, those people are going to get those things. <laughs> okay. You know, absolutely. But um, it's great that, it, it, that a bar matters to somebody like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it had a huge impact, man. Uh, and it will be sorely missed. Um, I know one of my questions, and maybe you kind of alluded to that earlier with, you know, staff shortages and stuff. With a bar that seems to be doing so well and, and has such an impact and such a big following and, you know, even the mayor is, is tweeting about it and Instagramming yeah. about it. Um, why are we seeing the Atomic come to an end? It's a couple things, right? It, it, it's the intersection of a couple things. Uh, Rachel and I got divorced this year, right? So, I mean, this... this um, oh, I'm sorry to hear about that, man. This industry is notoriously fatal for relationships, right? It's, it, it definitely happens. Yeah. It's, it's, it's built into the bread of the, uh, of the industry. So... That's one thing. But even putting that aside, wrapped out and packed it aside, it, now we move on to the, any of the other number of things. I could still continue doing this bar. Um, the staffing shortage is, is crazy. It's crazy. Listen, we have a waitress the other day who showed up, and this is why I think I, I moved it from October 9th to September. It was a Thursday. She texted us in the morning, and she was off for the weekend. And she texted us busy. Now, by that, I mean she didn't text us, I have COVID. I got in a car accident. She said she was busy. She said she had too much shit to do before she went out of town. So she can't come to work. She has too many errands to run, so she can't come to her job. Now, that day, that left us a little bit shorthanded. So we couldn't serve anything from the jungle room back. So now I lose 20 seats. Now it's just the inside and the patio. I carded four people. And because we... We were overwhelmed inside. I sat them outside. A couple minutes later, I took a pen and paper. I took their order. Then I took that piece of paper and I went behind the bar and I made their drinks. And then I got a tray and then I ran their drinks to their table. How sustainable is that? Right. It's not sustainable. Uh, we're having people reach out to us and set up interviews for waitressing jobs. And we, set those in and we show up to those interviews. They do not. We never hear from them again. Even though they said, we'll see you there at 3.30. I had a guy trained to be a bartender on Tuesday. He quit on Wednesday. He said he didn't like the hours. I, had a, I hired a girl on Tuesday. On Wednesday, she put in her notice because she got a job at Top Golf. You know, so, and you know, uh, it's not even about money. There's this narrative about, like, they're not making enough money, but they're making $35, $35 an hour. Yeah. So, you know, and the, it's not about money. I, I know a bar down the street that pays your health insurance, and they're almost a revolving door of people coming and going. It's not about that. People have just left the industry, and they've left every industry, it feels. You know, like, yeah. there's not school bus drivers. There's My Budweiser was delivered by a guy in a suit the other day because there was no truck driver. They're just, they're just not there. Yeah. And so that's the actual problem. We're so busy, but we can't staff. Can't staff. Yeah. And, I, I mean, we were so short-staffed the other day that – I, it took 20 minutes for somebody to get a beer. And that's only that's with seated service. It's only 80 people. So part of the problem is that we're too busy. Yeah. So it's, it's a staffing issue. There's a supply chain issue. I couldn't find sugar the other day. I couldn't find pineapple juice. And every week, it's something else that has disappeared. You know, aluminum is gone. I have a buddy who owns a brewery who has no problem making the beer, no problem no. Putting, putting it in the keg. He can't get it anywhere because the pallets are gone to ship them, you know? Yeah. Miller Lite had me on back order for Miller Lite for four weeks. I couldn't sell. So if the shelves are bare, if there's nobody there to work, how do you do this? If the shelves are bare and you, there's nothing to sell, how do you do this? Um, you know who had Miller Lite? Publix. You know what I can't do? I can't drive over to Publix and buy Miller Lite because that's illegal. There's like laws against that? You there's laws. Just... You have to buy all your liquor on your liquor license. Okay. Um, so it, it's those things, you know, it's not yeah. just one battle that's out there. It's 10 battles. Yeah. And I'm happy to fight one or two, 
But I was fighting 10 battles. And at 10 battles, I was just, I think I, I was done. Sure, that, yeah. That's why it's not happening. It can be, um, it sounds incredibly overwhelming. It's overwhelming because you're just there, like, at 7 in the morning, you're there until 2. You know, you're just doing everything. Yeah. And then it becomes kind of joyless. Like that day that I sat those people and I took their order and then I made their drinks, I should, I could have enjoyed all of those things if I was just doing one of them, but doing four of them, it made it feel like a chore. You probably got in the back of your mind other people that need help and Absolutely, need service. Absolutely. By the time stuff. I served those drinks, there was already a line. Yeah. You know, and I just looked at that line. I'm like, how will I possibly ever do the thing that I need to do? You know, I, I need to operate at a certain level. Yeah. And if I can't operate at that level, I just don't want to do it. You know, and luckily we had this window where the lease was expiring in October and we could get out. Yeah. So that's, that's just the way it had to go, you know? Yeah. I hate that it had to go, but it had to go. I understand. Yeah. Um, do you see other, I mean, I'm sure you're in cahoots with a lot of other bartenders or bar owners uh, and other bars and stuff. I guess this is industry-wide. I mean, everybody's industry struggling, oh, yeah. you know. Uh, my, my feed is full of, one, things closing. Um, and people, like, like randomly yesterday, the Collins Bar was closed. It just post, posted, we're closed today. I've seen that a lot, yeah. A lot, I've seen a people, lot. and they, they're they pretty honest about it. They're just like, hey, uh, don't really have our staff, or the staff that we do have is extremely exhausted. we got to give them a day off, and so we're taking a day. We're taking a day. Yeah. Yeah, our hours are shortening. There was an article the other day that a Chick-fil-A closed in Alabama because they didn't have the staff. A Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so, wow. I mean, yeah, well, I don't know. It's it's – uh, Tropicalio closed for a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think they, um, they're they ramping back up. But they're ramping back up. They've yeah. changed their menu and kind of revitalized some, some yeah. things. And, and I mean, more places are opening than closing. Yeah. You know, I mean, Ferris is about to open up. The Marble Ring is about to open back up. Are they? Yeah. Are they in that same location? The, I, n- nothing is different. Okay. The furniture is still where it is. Okay. I, I didn't know if they were um, if they were going to come back or not. I know Hot Diggity was there, and then they were gone, and then another restaurant was in that spot. and For like two seconds. Yeah, and they were Marble gone. And they're like, they're gone. And then I thought Ferris was just taken over. I didn't know Marble Ring. Well, they're the same owner. Like so. Oh, okay. Col- Colby, who owns uh, Ferris, owned that building. Okay. You know, and he was, he was the landlord. So when Marble Ring left, he just kept everything. Mm. So he's just reopening. As and it, he's... Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. When, uh, Ferris, are they also taking over the Parkside building as well? They're not. They're not. Okay, I w- heard from somebody that they, they were taking over like that whole city block I right mean, there. It, it's it's possible because I mean I'm in the loop, but I'm my information. Everything is such a quickly moving thing. Sure, it's a roller coaster. The information that I have yesterday, which you know I had a conversation about Parkside yesterday, maybe you know not valid today. Okay, everything's moving so quickly. So wow. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what's going to happen with Parkside. Their lease is over at the end of the month. I keep hearing different rumors. Um, I even heard a rumor that uh, the automatic seafood was going to close. Uh, I don't what? Know. Yeah. No, here's what's happening. People are mistaking automatic for atomic. And this broken television. Okay. Broken. Listen, when I go pick up my liquor, they bring out automatic seafood's liquor. Oh, really? Yeah. So that's it then. That's oh, that's yeah, why. Because yeah. my, my coworker mentioned, he's like, yeah, automatic is closing. I'm like... They're like they're doing fine. Like, they're what are you not, talking about? Absolutely not. They're closing. Listen, I've had people come in and they're like, I have a reservation. And I'm like, we don't take reservations. They're like, I have a six o'clock reservation. I'm like, do you think that you're at automatic seafood right now? And they're like, am I not? That was a common thing. Once a week. Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Once Glad I asked that question. Yeah, yeah. Automatic is not going anywhere. They're great. They're crushing it. So, uh, with the atomic closing down, um, all the cool stuff that you have. Obviously, we have a little bit of a set here, and we were talking yeah. earlier. Any chance we could get a hold of some of that? Or what's the plan for all the all the swag that's I in think, that place? I think the plan is to have, like, a a yard sale. Dude, that would be so cool. Yeah. A, a, a yard sale would probably – yeah, because, I mean, I've got to get all that stuff out. Yeah. So this is going to help because I, I don't want to move that couch. Yeah. Um, so I think on October 3rd. October 3rd. I'm marking my calendar. October 3rd, I think, yeah. It'll be in and around that date. That'd be awesome. Yeah, that'll give me some time to get some some things in and out of there. Give me some lava lamps and give me some jungle swag to hang from the ceiling. (laughs) When is this thing, when is this going to show? We typically, uh, probably at the time of this shooting, a week from yesterday. No, what's today? Monday? So we released an episode today. We'll release another one next okay, month. Who's your episode today? Uh, the episode we released today was uh, Blake Schultz. He's a uh, local realtor. Um, 
real estate investor. He was kind of blowing my mind as far as like I, all I, the stuff I, he just into. I, He's I, really cool. I bet. I bet. I mean, somebody talking about real estate right now could blow a lot of money. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's not. It's also not making any sense, you know. Dude, it was it was pretty cool conversation. I encourage anybody who's listening to check it out. Um, he's a really nice guy, and um, I brought him in, you know, just wanting to talk about the housing market, and then he went on this whole thing about how he invests in real estate and how he got started. And really cool story, and uh, yeah, really cool guy. And so uh, he um, gave me a list of books to read, and I actually ordered one off Amazon. Uh, just came in today, actually. Cool. So I'm gonna try to cool. learn a little bit about how I can. Did you have you ordered our cocktail book yet? Uh, no, I have not, but I have seen it. I saw okay. the the thing for it, the yeah. Atomic Lounge. We actually got a picture of it I right here. That, yeah. If you uh, you can pre-order it. it th- I've been told. Yeah, that pull that up, be... Katie. It's that first photo right there. I told it should be should be here next week. Dude, so um, it's just like an awesome little like coffee table book, I guess. It's uh, it's not coffee table size, but it's like maybe I don't know, sixteen by eighteen. It's a good size. It's hardcover. It has all the cocktails up until about two months ago. Okay. Um, now, was this a book you guys were already in the works of we've making? We've been working on it for a year. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, over a year. Because, I mean, there's a lot of photography, a lot of layout. Um, yeah, no, it looks rad. Uh, do you know who John T. Edge is? Uh, not right off my so top of my head. No, John T. Don't. Edge is basically the Anthony Bourdain of the South. Oh, okay. So much I should that, probably know about this guy. You should probably know him, yeah, yeah. He's based out of Oxford, Mississippi. He established something called the SFA. Um, in, in fact, when Anthony Bourdain did an episode on the South, his guide was John T. Edge. Oh, okay. Right. He was, he helped, he's the one that helped him navigate like the juke joints and the food yeah, places, you, you know? Check, yeah. Okay. John um, T. Edge. Well, John check T. Edge out. wrote the forward for our book. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, it's really, again, it, everything about the bar that's ever happened has just been like crazy dumb luck because I reached out to him because he came in the bar one time and he wore a squirrel costume and I asked if we could use that picture of him in a squirrel costume and he said, yeah, has um, anybody done the forward for your book yet? And I was just like, what are you, what? Ta- what are you talking about? How do you know about, about that? Right? And I'm like, no. He goes, well, I'd be happy to do it. I'm like, shit. Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, it's been such a lucky thing. And, it, you know, I hate that the bar is closing, but the way it's closing, I think the timing of the book coming out, I think yeah. it, it, it's, a, it, it's a good thing, you know? I think a lot of places, a lot of things don't end when they should end. Mm. You know, I mean, a lot of things just go bad. And I think that there's a, a certain justice or sense to closing at the when you're at the top of your game or you're the best of your game you know why just go on until like it sucks yeah you know why just go on until like you're on a bar rescue episode <laughs> yeah yeah you know that's a good point yeah so i i think it it it, it was the right time you know yeah uh, not that i give a shit about reviews i do give a, sh- a little bit about reviews but i always marvel that our facebook uh, reviews were five out of five and as we're coasting into the end of it i'm like please don't Please don't go down to a 4.9 yeah. like in the last week. But as of today, it's like a perfect thing. Wow. In a world full of Karens, I'm like, how did we manage to How did we manage, how did we to, manage to pull that off? That's pretty wild. And I'm like, okay, well, good. This is, then it, it's trapped in amber. It's going to be a five forever. I could imagine, uh, I've, you know, surfing through uh, all the photos and stuff. A lot of people have visited your bar. Um, obviously, uh, the gentleman you just mentioned who decided to do the forward for your book. Who other, uh, any other memorable people that have rolled through there? You're just like, wow, I, was I can't thinking, believe this guy's here. I was thinking about it, but like, you know, do you know a band called Thievery Corporation? Uh, yes, I do. I mean, they're massive. They're huge. They yeah. came to Birmingham, and I was just like, what are you doing in Birmingham? They played Iron City. They play festivals. They played 100,000 100, people. Um, they played, and I guess they had like a, a, a night the next day where they didn't play anywhere. So mm-hmm. they were like, let's go out. And they ended up off coming, night in the ham. Off night in the ham. Yeah. They talked to one or two people and they mentioned the atomic and they came to the atomic. They put on costumes. They came behind the bar and played uh, and made sex panthers. Yeah. They, uh, we exchanged phone numbers. Like we're talking about a very famous group of people. They texted me like the next day. Um, they posted on Instagram about how something you know um about how you never know what's going to happen especially in a town that you've never heard of mm-hmm. when you're playing you discover the most amazing thing and then they tag the atomic lounge you know yeah um juliana huff when she was in town came in fred durst came in fred durst came in yeah i didn't even recognize him he came in with some, oh he was filming that movie he wasn't was filming he? that terrible movie that terrible movie, that movie yeah yeah, yeah. Out to be the worst movie ever yeah, made. yeah yeah have you seen that movie no i haven't oh it is really i've seen bad. the trailer for it's it really it's really got a bad. john travolta in it right yes, it's yeah, yeah shocking yeah. Yeah. No, I, I read all the headlines when they were in town. They're like, John Travolta's filming a movie with Fred Durst as the director. And I was just like, 
okay, John Travolta's career is at an all-time low. All-time low. <laughs> if he's doing that. Uh, but, you know, the thing for Fred is that, like, when he finished filming, he got on an airplane and went to Germany and started his European tour for Limp Bizkit to sold-out shows. Yeah. Well, there's a lot so, of hardcore Limp Bizkit fans. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe they paid Lollapalooza this year. Yeah. So, um, let's see. Who else was there? Uh, who's the guy who plays, um, you know, the clown in It? The clown in It? Guard. Peter Skarsgård. Peter Skarsgård. He came in. He came in? Because he was filming a movie with the guy, the kid who plays Spider-Man. So the two of them came in. What? Yeah. The, the current Spider-Man? The current Spider-Man, who's a like kid, right? He's a <sighs> What's oh. his name? What's his name, Katie? No. I'm going to have to look it up. Oh, that's terrible. He's like one of the biggest actors right now. I can't think of his name. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of superhero movies. Um, so, anyway. So they came in. The Head and the Heart came in. Um... It, random people like Bill Bellamy came in. You wouldn't, you're too young to remember this, but one of the first DJ VJs on MTV was a, a woman named Kennedy. Okay. Yeah. I mean, she was a big deal for me growing up, right? Mm -hmm. She was in here because she's now dating some MMA fighter who was a big deal. Everybody in the bar was freaking out that he was there. They had no idea who she was. But when we, I got to the table, I didn't know who he, who he was. I'm like, holy fuck, that's Kennedy. Mm. They put on Sex Panther tattoos. Um, so th those things that I'm like, this is fucking crazy. That is crazy. Listen, there's a guy named, um, shit, Dale DeGroff. Okay. In the, in the bar business, he is the grandfather of grandfathers. He brought cocktails back. Um, he's a monster in this business. Okay. He came into town and he, um, he walked in, it was a Tuesday and he walked in, he goes, where's Faisal? And just the idea that he, th those words came out of his mouth melted my brain. It's like, oh, I'm right here. Oh, I'm right here. Like, what are you talking about? How do you know my name? And he sat down. He goes, I guess I'm getting a sex panther. And there's a woman who comes in all the time. Her name's Kay, uh, like a 45, 50-year-old black lady. She puts on that Elvis costume every single time. And so she had just gone to the bathroom. And when she was coming back, uh, Dale DeGroff, famous cocktail guy, who she has no idea who he is, was fumbling around with his sex panther tattoo. And she was like, let me show you how this works. And so while I'm making his Sex Panther tattoo, I look at the end of my bar. Dale DeGroff, cocktail icon, is having a Sex Panther tattoo applied to him by a black lady in an Elvis costume. In an Elvis costume. <laughs> yeah. And I was just like, this is everything that could, I could possibly hope for. That's so really cool. Amazing. And this was years ago, so it was great. None of those are even close to about two years ago. Um, it's Again, it's Tuesday. It's quiet. And a guy comes in. He goes, hey. Do you mind if I take one of these booths? I need a private booth. A friend of mine is coming in. He's kind of famous. And it was like 10 o'clock on a Tuesday. I had extra booths. I'm not worried about it. No problem. We have famous people coming nope. in all the yeah. time. Not a big deal. Yeah. Jay-Z has that booth in a little while. Yeah. Yeah. To, sorry. And then I saw, he, was a, he was a regular guy that I knew from around town. So he could have had the booth no matter what. Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, it's all yours. And then I, I said, just out of curiosity, who's your famous guy? And he goes, Mike Mills from R.E.M. R.E.M. And I knew that that had to have been true because Mike Mills, he was playing at the Lyric that night. Hmm. So I'm like, that's crazy. My heart sank because my favorite band is R.E.M. Really? My first tattoo was literally the letters R.E.M. on my shoulder. Okay. Yeah. Super fan here. Super fan. Now, Mike Mills, what is he like the, the lead he's, guitarist or he's, what is he? He's the, he, well, so there's four founding members and he's the he plays guitar. Okay. Um, so... I'm still kind of digesting it like two minutes later, and sure as fucking shit, Mike Mills walks in. He looks at his buddy, who's like 60 or 70, and he goes, I didn't know you were this cool. And I'm like, that's crazy. So I make him his drinks. Uh, I don't know how he got my name. Maybe I introduced myself, and he called me Faisal the whole night, which yeah. in itself would be overwhelming, right? Sure. Um, at some point, I was putting up a squirrel costume because he was sitting at the end of the bar, and he goes, what costume is that? I go, it's the squirrel costume. He goes, let me have it. Fucking put on that squirrel Everybody costume. Everybody loves the squirrel yeah, costume, the squirrel. man. Oh, my gosh. They got to have it. He put on that squirrel costume. You know, he was like my childhood hero. Like, I mean, he defined my, my teens and 20s. Yeah. And here he is drinking one of my cocktails. He's put on a Sex Panther costume. Um, and I go, can I ask you for a favor? He goes, well, what? I go, will you come back behind my bar and make me a drink? He goes, well, I'm not a very good bartender. I go, all I drink Does is it doesn't matter. I drink whiskey and Coke. <laughs> yeah. You can't mess it up, man. And he went back there and he made me a whiskey and Coke. Dude. And I'm just like, this is crazy. That is so, crazy, yeah, man. I mean, we've had a lot of famous people come in there, and that was easily the biggest, best one. Yeah. yeah. The drinks, the entire atmosphere, the whole thing, I can tell, you know, this is something that you really love doing. Um, if we can get past, what's the future for you, it's, if you had to? Yeah, you know, I mean, I probably don't want to talk about it. Okay. Because it's, it's not really a, a realized thing. Yeah. Do I have like a 
floor plan for a place? Am I looking, am I seeing an architect on Wednesday? Yes. Okay, so there's a possibility of something there, new, there a new endeavor. A yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, but I still cool. have to sort of hash out the issues that that aren't... Um, I mean, those problems, are, result, still those problems there. are still there. Yeah. Right? The staffing is still an issue. The supply chain is still an issue. Um, we never even touched on the whole idea that the world has gone mad. Yeah, oh, so, definitely. So that, you know, I'm kicking out people all the time, um, that people are sneaking in their own fireball. That um, Really? Yeah. That I, I'm talking about like 60-year-old people who are like, I'll go to their table, and like a mini of fireball is on their table. So they're not buying drinks. They just come to hang out. They're just coming to hang out, or they're sneaking in stuff, and uh, they're just what? behaving badly. That's weird. There's a number of people that have tried to fight me at that door. Um so I mean, you, I mean, surely you've seen. Well, that. it's a bar. I guess I can imagine. Listen, yeah. it's a it's a bar, but I mean, surely you saw that video a few weeks ago of them having to duct tape that guy to his airplane seat. Yeah, right? yeah, right. No, they're going insane. It's that person, yeah, they're going insane in grocery stores, at daycare centers, at football games, you know. And that's no different, and maybe even more magnified at a bar. Sure. So on get top a few of the, fireballs in me. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, we're able to curate who comes in there because the people that are drawn to the place are like passionate about you know bubbles and costumes uh and but every now and then you get like a really bad apple yeah um so it, that's still going to be there yeah the staffing thing is not going to be any better so i think i just have to put my mind to how to how to mitigate those problems you know i was promised robots quite a while ago <laughs> yeah. and i'm not seeing robots uh, yeah, i'm not seeing robots yeah so my you know my robot waitress is just not showing up yeah um so i think i think it's just a matter of Shrinking the footprint, um, making it a Thursday, Friday, Saturday thing. Uh, Table service sounds like it's probably around to stay. Uh, for me, for me, it is. I mean, I know there's a few places that have opened up recently that just simply say order at the bar. Yeah. I think that's them trying to sort of like not rely on your waitress not showing up because she's too busy. Sure. Um, I think, yeah. Fuck, I was at Taco Bell the other day. The woman that took my order... When she finished taking it, she went to the back and made my tacos. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And you could see the hair falling out of her head in clumps. And it's that's crazy. The thing that, that, like, you know, the few people that you do keep on there, as long as they stay exposed to this, where they're doing the job of two people, three people, ten people, they won't be there that long. And they won't even stay in the business because they'll be like, they know the next place they go to will be the same thing. Yeah, no, it's a nightmare. So they'll go to Lyft. Mm. They'll go to uh, Shipped. You know, some gig economy where they can work when they want to work. It doesn't have somebody like throwing up on them or trying to fight them. Yeah, you know, I can imagine. Yeah, it's it's a it's a lot. So, um, so the next project, I also have to come up with a third concept. You know, it would be it's it's one thing to make that really great first album. Mm. It's really impossible to to avoid that sophomore slump, which we somehow did. You know. Yeah. But to make a third great album would was really hard to do. So I think that's that's the thing that I have to figure out. You know. Yeah. If 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 there if that's in, if that's there. Yeah. So until that's there, I think I, I wouldn't pull the trigger on something. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's gonna be. But, but, a, but Birmingham is where I want to do it. Okay. So no chances of like trying to move off to another city or anything like that. I don't think so. Yeah. Well, maybe you ought to take some time off, man. Just like go. Listen, I'm, uh, going to, I'm going to beach on Thursday. There you I've, been, go. I've been looking for this trip forever. Um, Tropical storm Nicholas. Oh, we got another one? It, Are you yeah. serious? It just made landfall on the Texas coast. Oh, man. Um, it will be making its way to my beach house um, the day I arrive. Ah, uh, well. That, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, tomorrow, you know, tomorrow sensibly would be the first day of the Atomic, mm -hmm. but it's closed. Yeah. So I'll start taking days off right there. There you go. Yeah. Well, that'll be good, man. Be a, maybe a good reset, you know. Yeah. Kind of let the creative juices flow, and, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I may pick up a, 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 a shift here and there at the Nick. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we might see you bartending. You might town. see you bartending. Yeah, but then you got to make your way to the Nick at two in the morning. Yeah. Being someone that's so heavily involved in drinking or in uh, mixing drinks and yeah. and obviously working in bars, having expansive history and being in GQ for your your that mixing skills. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what are some of your favorite drinks? You mentioned the Sex Panther a lot, and obviously that's a pretty iconic drink for the Atomic. I, you know, I, I I do like like classics like like the Last Word. I'll drink an old fashioned when I'm out. Yeah. You know, if I want to feel fancy. But I really you know, it's to me it's whiskey and coke. Okay. Uh, I was drinking gin and tonics for a long time. I drink fireball. I drink Jaeger. You know, I think that they're I think they're they're great drinks. I mean think really drinking is classic drinks just never get classic. old, I guess. It's just classic to somebody else, right? That's all. Um so that that that's what I drink when I when I'm out, you know? Because I'm not really drinking at cocktail bars. 
Yeah. So where are your favorite, some of your favorite places to hang out when you're out? When you have free, it doesn't sound like you have a ton of free time. I don't. I don't. Maybe you will now. But Last yeah. night I, I went to some places that I hadn't been to in a long time. Like I hadn't been in the garage in a long time. I uh, stopped by the Nick to see some friends there. Um, Brown Derby as much as I can. Yeah. It's such a great place. That, um, but yeah, my brother's uh, uh, studio that he's building is actually just right next door to the Brown Derby. Yeah. It was like an old abandoned building right there. And uh, yeah, so he's uh, right next door. So every time we're over there, it's like, hey, let's just walk over. It's great. The pool tables yeah. are always l- leveled. Yeah, we can hear them hanging out at the, all the time. Yeah. So. yeah, the bartenders are great. The owner's there all the time, and she's really, really sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't really try to go to cocktail bars that much because, I don't know, I I own a cocktail bar. so Yeah, I, I, I can imagine that, that would get bar. a little old. Yeah. Yeah. Or want to do something different. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, where do you see – there's been so much happening in Birmingham. And, uh, you know, it's like every time I turn around, there's a new restaurant, there's a new bar, there's something new popping up. And the city is just exploding. They can't build houses and condos fast enough. Fast it's crazy. Enough, yeah. um, where do you see the future of Birmingham heading? I, I think we need to be a little bit careful, you know, because this isn't the same city that I, I moved to uh, 15 years ago in good ways and in bad ways, right? Like when I when I was downtown 15 years ago – there were fucking packs of wild dogs on First Avenue. Like, wild dogs. Yeah. Like, that's Mad Max shit. You know, that's failed economy stuff because they'd have, everybody had abandoned it. And I, I'm okay with, like, opening it here and there and taking it slow. I just think that, you know, if you've been going to Nashville for a couple of years, which I've been going to Nashville now for, let's say, 10 years, and I don't go to Nashville anymore because it's fucking awful, you know, because they have overwhelmed all these, like, Germantown, which used to be this great... Uh, part of town that had like old houses, house, 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 now has nothing but like those five story developments. Yeah. You know, those condos that are $2,000 a month with like a, a Smoothie King in the bottom or maybe a, a restaurant, you know? But all the character of that town is gone. So, like, I don't know about these, like, park side. You know, the park is great. But if we're just going to make ourselves look like every other town, if we just want like a Jenny's ice cream, you know? I think we're going to forget the fact that the thing that made Birmingham Birmingham is the blue monkeys and the urban standards. You know, I get that we want to have Frothy Monkey on 2nd Avenue. But again, it's the second or third or fifth location of another business, you know? Yeah. And I I think the charm of that city is that there is this one thing and that there's some texture to it. Like in the 15 years I've been here, so many amazing one-of-a-kind buildings have just been torn down to build something new. So I think the future I, – I don't think we should be so so um, romanced by the idea that there's progress or that there's buildings going up or that mm. there's cranes in the sky because, I mean, there's a danger to that you know, yeah. where you lose this identity. Or just the, the overwhelming – just the size. You know, like I know uh, – I went to school at UAB and I always thought that Birmingham is like the perfect size. You yes. know what I mean? Like I'm not in like – Middle of nowhere, but I'm in a big city, but it's not too big. You know, all, yeah, you have all I get anxiety going to Atlanta. You know, it's just like, yeah. oh my God, this is too much. And you know, it's just like an ant bed. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like an ant bed. And the traffic and, is terrible. And the traffic is terrible. And it's yeah. just like, man, I really hope that uh, Birmingham doesn't go that same route where we're like just another giant mega city. You know, and I guess that in a lot of ways, that's a good thing. I mean, everything that's happening with City Walk and uh, the new stadium and, and all the things that are happening that are inevitable, you know, when people want to come and invest in a city. Yeah. But how do you mitigate some of the bad things? Yeah, how do you things? mitigate like that? The first time I saw Top Golf, I was like, that's disgusting. That's really terrible. Yeah, I heard, I've heard some other people say they weren't too happy with like, oh, you know, just the skyline. The skyline. The, the, the giant skyline, net. That giant net. There's like a hundred year old church across the street. Yeah. You know, like, what are you talking about? Who let that happen? I mean, at some point, it's not about money, you know? There are ways to sort of I, I think somebody's just not paying attention to that stuff. And I, I think that's the danger of what's going to happen to Birmingham. Mm-hmm. Like, I will leave Birmingham when it becomes Nashville, you know? Do you think there's any way, any stopping it? I, I mean, don't think so. I mean, it's no, because going to happen. Everything is, everything is dollar-based, right? Right. I mean, because all those things like Top Golf, that's tax revenue. And when you're part of the city council and you're trying to pay bills and you're trying to keep the garbage off the streets, you have to pay those bills and that's your priority, right? Yeah. Jobs, taxes. So when you see something like a Top Golf, you're like, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we were kind of talking about this earlier. Uh, you mentioned um, just talking about the city and the city council. Have you ever had any issues uh, where your heads, have, where you kind of butted heads with maybe the city or the city council or anything? I'll tell you what. Early on, 
I was really shocked at how how easy the process was um, for working with the city. Yeah, how hard is it to start a bar? It you know it, it was so interesting that. Everybody had a different experience. Like at that time, like five or eight different people were starting a bar or a restaurant. And none of them had the same experience. There was no way we could sort of like help each other because we were all experiencing different things. There wasn't any sort of one way to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, a lot of it that ended up happening, like like we submitted our, our liquor license application like on Monday, on Monday, and I think we had it on Friday. And then I, I meet people that were like, oh, yeah, we've been waiting six months for it. Yeah. So there was no really rhyme or reason. There was no – Y'all just got lucky. <laughs> I think we got lucky, yeah. The truth is that, like, Rachel is ve was very good about, like, uh, paperwork and detail and stuff like that. So yeah. I think she was just good about crossing T's and dotting I's. And that's that maybe was, was part of that. But we also got lucky in a few other ways. Have we recently had a few more problems with the city? Yeah. But I – I guess it could be worse. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse. The you know the mayor has been a big supporter of the bar, and when somebody in that office is in your corner, you know you tend to have an easier go of it. Sure. Yeah. You just so, call Woodfin on the phone. Just, hey, I'm just, having a problem, man. Yeah. Uh, can you help me yeah. out here? Just send him a snap Snapchat. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um. So I mean, citywide, citywise, I think that we, we've had a pretty good experience for sure. That's cool. Well, being one of the raddest bars in town is, uh, probably helps. A little it do, bit. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't hurt. Yeah, yeah. They can get a table in there, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there are a lot of really great bars like on on 2nd Avenue and 1st Avenue. So, I mean, we just are, you know, one of those options. But, yeah, I, I, I think it turned out real great. Also, I've got the mayor's picture up behind me. Yeah, yeah. sure. So on that Sergeant Pepper's. little wall of uh, – yeah. uh, A fame. Wall of fame, yeah. Yeah, so that, that helps. That's cool. It grease greases that wheel. Remind me the two tables when you when you first came in, you had like a lounge area in the front and you kind of hit the bar. Mm -hmm. uh, when COVID happened, you guys went to um, after everything kind of opened back up, you went back to uh, table service, right. and it seemed like you invented some new nooks and crannies where you could put some more tables we and did, have yeah, more seating. We lost some seats, so I had to be like I had to find some seats, and then you know the place was already broken up into like different sort of vignettes. Yeah, and so we sort of like dialed up the vignette so that it had walls around it. It had carpet around it. It had more plants around it, so you could just... I was always amazed that when I came in there, especially to see some of the photos that you've been posting this week of how you guys first started and how it's just an empty building. Yeah, the door that the you walked in didn't that even exist. You could envision all of that yeah. and to make it work. And it just, it was, you know, just using the little bit of space we'd have down here for this project, I was like, man, it was such an inspiration coming to your bar because I yeah. was like, he could squeeze all this stuff and still make it feel like... I'm not in a cramped space. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, but it's still, it's like just all the stuff you had everywhere. I was just very impressed. Did you do a lot of that yourself? Or No, I did everything. I built everything there. I painted every wall and hammered every nail. The roof and just the way you the were able to, it, yeah. to, I don't know. I just, from a, I guess from a builder's perspective, like just everything you're able to do in that space and to make it what it was. It's, yeah, it was very, it's very, very DIY for sure. But in the best way possible. Yeah. Like it, it looked intentional yeah. as far as everything like – and you had like – you mentioned my, my soccer trophy I have back here. Like you had like bowling trophies and stuff in there and just yeah. – where did you find some of this stuff? Like where do you find all well, this I mean, retro I, I could, stuff? Yeah, the retro stuff like is um like, you know – Facebook Marketplace. There's a one or two stores. There's a place called Avondale Antiques over okay. in Avondale, uh, which is amazing. The guy, this guy, Fred. That oh, that's just – is that in the – It's over Crest? by Moms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, it's great. Uh, like, he was the source of, like, a bulk of my things for sure. Because that stuff's not easy to find. We were talking about the old TVs, you know. Those are like, really I've been wanting to get one for down here, and I can't find them. And if you do find them online, I mean, they want, like, several hundred dollars for a working unit. Yeah. And it's like, and by working, like it's just got snow. Yeah, on. Like, yeah. You're not gonna be able to watch TV. I don't want to watch anything. I just want it to turn on. You know? Yeah, yeah. So around the time we opened it, there was like a, an interest in all those things. So they were they were disappearing real quick. Really? Yeah. But we got lucky and we got creative with a bunch of things. Um, well, that's cool, man. It yeah. worked. It worked was, really well. We had to get an architect to actually lay out the footprint of the thing so we can get our permits. Okay. So he basically just drew walls. He drew like light, you know, egress things, just basic stuff. And then um, I said to, I pointed to a, a port part of the bar. I'm like, "What is? What's this?" He goes, "Well, that's nothing. You can't do anything with that. That's dead space." And I was like, "That's not dead space. I can put a table for two there." And he goes, "You can't put a table for two there." And then so we just went ahead and did it. And I put a table for two there, and I named it after him. 
Uh, like it had a sign uh, dedicating yeah. it to him. The first time he came into the bar, I sat him in that space. I was like, oh, you sat him in that I space? I sat him. He, he, he was an architect named Richard Carnaggio. And it was the Richard Carnaggio table. That's cool. Like, See, I put a table. I put two people in here. Because you have to get really creative because the footprint is so small, right? Yeah. Um, so, but, but it turns out like people really, they would ask for that table. Yeah. Because it was intimate. You know? Yeah, it's because they wanted to find cool. out who Richard Carnaggio was. Yeah, why is this table named after him? You know, right. Now, was it when you first started out? You said you didn't really know what the idea for the bar was going to be, at least not the entire picture. No, so, what did the first month of the bar look like? Well, the first, and it's funny just to sort of wrap up the bar with a lineup down the street. The day we opened, we had a lineup down the street. Really? Yeah, and in fact, to give complete closure, the first person in line the day we opened was a guy named Matt Logden. On Saturday, the first person in line was Matt Logden. <laughs> you know, it was very sort of, you know, unbelievable. And how long did the Atomic run for? Uh, probably about four and a half years. Four and I mean, a half years. Our lease okay. is five. So, like, it's, you know, and we took us about six months to build. Okay. So, about about five years. We were nominated for three James Beard Awards. Uh, What's that of, like? Or how do you even get nominated? And, yeah, I don't know. It was a just mystery. random? It was. Hey, by the way, uh, really uh, James Beard Award, here you go. Here you go. <laughs> and especially in a place that's so off the beaten path, right? Yeah. And the morning that we got nominated for our first one, people like my phone went off and just dinged, and then dinged twice more, and then twice more after that. I was like, what, "What's happening?" And it was somebody saying, "Congratulations!" And then the second one said, "Congratulations!" I'm like, "For what?" And then they sent us that screenshot of the nomination. And to me, it was just a, it's for food, you know, because mm -hmm. Highlands has been nominated several times, and not just food, but like white tablecloth food, yeah, French laundry shit, you know. Yeah, I thought it was just for food. Two, they they have two spirits categories, outstanding distiller, outstanding bar program. The bar program one is a national one, so it's not regional. So when I looked at it, it was like San Francisco and New Orleans, Chicago, New York. And you're right there in the Los Angeles in the and Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah. Man, it was crazy. And the beauty of it is it was alphabetical, so we were at the top. Oh, that worked So out. people kept saying, thinking that we were like at the top. It was like, it's alphabetical. No, no, I would, I would just yeah. cover that up. Yeah, you're no big deal. It was deal. pretty crazy, and then like we weren't even aware of it. And the problem with becoming aware of that is that you become hyper aware of it. So the next year, when those rolled around again, and I'd never even thought about it before, now it's all I thought about. Yeah, you know, like there's a thing about getting nominated and not getting nominated. You're like, sure. Shit, what did I do wrong? You know, do I suck now? Yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, but we got renominated. Which we were like, that's pretty so cool. So you're like, all right, here yeah. we go. Yeah. And I kind of like just out of curiosity looked at the 20 on the first list that we were nominated and the 20 on the new one. And like there were only 10 renominations and we were one of them. So like the bar in San Francisco didn't get renominated. The bar in New York didn't get renominated, but we did. You know, we rolled into our third year and got nominated again. Um, by the time of the fourth year, COVID happened. And in that environment, Restaurants and bars were closing all over the place, you know? Sure. So it really wasn't the environment for you to have an award, you know? Fair enough. So they pivoted to, like, more of a support situation where they were, like, raising money. They were basically trying to, like, feed bar and uh, restaurant industry people. Yeah. So, and I don't know if they'll come back, but if they do, they'll come back in a different form, you know? Because I don't think the industry is going to go back to a best of, you know? Really? I don't think you don't, so. You don't see don't, it going I, back I to the think, way things were. I think like even like the Oscars and the Emmys and things like that, you know? I think because in the in the face of actual tragedy, you know, um, loss of jobs and 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 death, obviously because COVID, you know, 600,000 people sure. died. Yeah. I don't know that there's the stomach for things as trivial and banal as... I make the best, best I make cocktail. The best cocktails. I'm yeah. the best, you know, taco truck, that kind yeah. of stuff, you know? I think what... We have to sort of be a little bit more sensitive to those things, but also reprioritize, you know, what what this body is here to do, you know. And the James Beard Awards are here to highlight um, uh, minority-owned restaurants, you know, um, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, social justice. Yeah. Things like that. So they just send, like, people into your bar when you're not knowing? Like, hey, uh, we need to... We're thinking about nominating this bar. You have to go in there and check out some yeah, of their drinks. It's still pretty opaque to me. There was one time where... So you don't know how. They... There was one time where, like, I had a door guy who was very good about why he's checking IDs and stuff like that, engaging the person, like, what are you doing here? Have you been here before? And he asked this one group, like, what are you doing here? Have you been here before? I'm like, no, we're not from here. We're actually with the James Beard Foundation. Oh, they just told him. <laughs> they just told him, yeah, that's what we're doing here. We're, you know, doing some research. And then they went to table A2 in the back. Code red, code red, they're here. Well, he code, you better believe it. He code redded. 
and he sent a waitress to me to tell me that give them the best seat. James now. James Beard people are sitting at A two, which is just a seat, not the yeah. best seat. It's a seat. In fact, it's not the best seat because the real energy of the room is in the front room. But so they ended up at a shitty table, and I kind of forgot about him because it really wasn't my my interest. You know, the James Beard people sitting at that table are no more important. I'm not going to change what I do for them. Everybody gets the same treatment, and luckily I forgot about them, so I wasn't able to do anything. We're stressing them. about it. Yeah. We're stressing about it, right? Then they left before I even remembered that they had been there, and the door guy again asked them how their night was. They said it was wonderful. I'm like, did you try some of the drinks? They're like, no, we we drank Heineken's all night. <laughs> so you know, they, they drank Heineken's all night. But that year we were nominated for a James Beard. I, and I the think, atmosphere was cool I enough, it's, man. It speaks, so, it, it speaks so much to the idea that it's not really about the cocktail. You yeah. Know? The service, the vibe, the environment, the energy of the place, you know? Are people having fun? Yeah. Are people having fun? And I think maybe they saw everybody's having fun. They saw that there was an ener a positive energy in the room. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's what carries us, you know, through. That's so, awesome. Yeah, that, that, that's one of my favorite things that, that has happened there, you know? Well, that's cool. Well, I know this has probably been a tough week for you, man. Um, just it, it going been, through it everything. Been a tough week too because, you know, the, the way ever since we announced, every, every day is a Friday. Yeah. You know, so it's like we're busy from the day we opened. Have y'all had the line down the street like we saw on Friday? Yeah. Every Yeah. Dang. Well, we were talking about coming, but I was like, man, it's going to be busy, but we can go. And we came pretty early Friday, but I was like, well, it's Friday. And we didn't even stop. We just were rolling down the street. And I was like, oh, yeah, people are like camped out, like yeah. <laughs> waiting. Yeah, which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah, I mean, it cleared up eventually, but and you can never really get the rhythm of when people are coming or not. Yeah, you know, and a lot of people left because they were just so frustrated. But there's sure. nothing we can really there's do about that, you know. Yeah. So, um, but it was a good run. That was good. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, I wish you all the best in all your future endeavors and Thanks. whatever those endeavors may be. Maybe and, uh, you can have me back for a follow up when I actually do sign that next lease. And there you go. Like, yeah, I can tell you what the name of the give us some more there. details and yeah. stuff. And you actually brought some of the props. We got to show some of this stuff on camera before we get ready. Katie, oh. can you grab those? Um, uh, I definitely want to come to that yard sale that you guys are going to have. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll make sure we we put it on our website. And yeah, no, I think a lot of people. Well, maybe we shouldn't talk about it because I want to snag up some cool stuff before it disappears. <laughs> right. It'll be like a pre-sale. So Thank these you. are some of the the iconic masks that, uh, yeah. and and you can see they've had a little bit of wear and tear. They have a little bit of wear and tear, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah. Well, that's cool, man. So it it adds to sort of like the surreal nature of, of the of the vibe in there, you know. Yeah. Um, that's I think. Got to hang on to these bad boys. I think that's crawfish. I guess that that yeah, yeah it kind of looks shrimp. like a crop a shrimp maybe. Kind of looks like a shrimp, sure. Yeah. Oh, I think you do. Okay. All I'll right. I'll do it if you do it. All right. I'm going to go. I got to do it with the toucan. Will it fit over our, our headsets? I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to take mine off. Okay. That. All right. I think we should have done this. The, we should have done this. Yeah. Thing. No, we can just go back and do the whole episode again. <laughs> just like this. This is uh, how many people you think have worn these? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. People always ask because they're, they're nervous. Are they clean? They're nervous. Are they clean? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're Halloween costumes, right? Yeah. And they're designed to be worn once a year. And once a they're, year. They're, they're worn like 20 times a night. So basically they fall apart every... So you're retiring weeks. a mask like... I throw them out all the time. Just all the time. I had no idea that my budget for costumes would be like thousands of dollars a year. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, Depends on, on the costume. That's crazy. I didn't even think about that. Like oh, that's like a major just, part of your like Yeah, of my line item. Of, yeah. 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 Like, and bubbles. You know how much money I spend on bubbles? Like bubble mix and bubble all that mix, stuff. Yeah. It's like thousands of dollars. And the costumes are probably ten thousand dollars worth of costumes. Ten thousand dollars worth Easily, of costumes. That's crazy. So yeah. Man. But again, you know, we I think we've gotten fifty thousand dollars worth of like social media use out of it. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a that's actually pretty genius, you know, because everybody who's wearing a toucan is like, take my picture, take tell my the picture. whole world where I'm at. Yeah. And yeah. then everybody's curious, and then they put it on. So yeah. it's pretty great. I've always enjoyed like... And that know, was just this, the whole mask thing was just like an organic thing uh, a, from, dumb, from dumb your luck. trip to Vegas. Yeah. 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 And just, I never, even like, I'll tell you this, that um, when I started the Collins Bar, I had a cocktail list in mind, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was in my head the whole time, and I had typewriters that were just there, and I was going to, because I'm such a hipster, I was going to just type out the menu. Oh, a typewriter. Right? So they'd be yeah. like, you know, the ink would be Oh, off, yeah, that's total hipster. I'm like, yeah. such a hipster thing. I type every single one. Well, the night we opened, I had been there all night folding paper airplanes. So at like 7 o'clock in the morning of opening, 
I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to write this cocktail list now. So I pulled out the typewriter, put in the paper, and fucking dust came off that typewriter. There was no ink on any of those ribbons. So I couldn't type out my cocktail list. We were opening in a few hours. I was never going to find ribbon in the next few hours. Oh, sure. Yeah. Who has so typewriter the, so ribbon? Typewriter like, ribbon. Come on, yeah, dude. What are you talking about? It's crazy. I had to build a time machine. That would take me a lot longer than just an afternoon. You never thought to test the typewriter first? I was so busy. It's you're like, right. nah, this will I, work. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. I should have tested it. That's funny, though. Yeah. That's so funny. what ha- ended up happening is that night when people came in, I said, listen, I will have a cocktail list. But why don't you just tell me what you like? I'll make you a drink. And the next person and the next person. And I'd assembled such a murderer's row of cocktail guys that they could really just riff a cocktail to order depending on if you told them that you were happy or sad or if you like vodka and you like sweet. Yeah. And so we went through that night and then the next night. And by that weekend when I had time to type out a menu, it occurred to me that maybe this was a better way to go. Maybe no cocktail list is the way to go because I'm making you not just a cocktail of mine that you like. I'm making you your cocktail. Yeah. And so that ended up sticking, but that was a a happy accident of the typewriter being out of ribbon. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with the costumes sort of has been a similar sort of happy accident. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. And that's cool because I did read about the Collins Bar not having a a cocktail menu, but I guess we just do it. But that's a cool backstory as to how it happened. that's the source why it it was supposed to. Because you didn't have typewriter ribbon. We didn't have typewriter ribbon that first day, so I had to make it up as I went along. But it worked, man. You have all these, like, cool stories for things that you're just kind of winging it, but then it worked out and became, like, standard, you know, where you were. And so... So... That's the thing. I'm going to have to sort of accidentally stumble into whatever it is for this next concept that, that makes it stand out, you know? Well, I'm sure if your history speaks uh, like it does, it's going to be awesome. And I look forward to it. And thank you, sir, for coming to hang out with us. Yeah. And uh, we can take these off for a second. Um, you know, Birmingham has a wiki on you. You know about that? I'm aware of my Birmingham yeah. wiki. Yeah. So I pulled that up and I was like, okay, I'm going to see what this guy's about. You know, have some talking points and stuff. And one of the things uh, was uh, when you were um, – I'm probably going to butcher this, so forgive me. But when you're in, you were in South Africa, right. you were a bar owner in South Africa, yeah. had your own place, and you left that bar because you oh. got tired of paying the mobsters. Yeah, it was the, fucking crazy. Like I can give that's you, a you, real story. I can give you like the thirty second version of that. All right, all right, we'll end on that. We got to have the thirty second okay. South African mob story. <laughs> the South African mob story is that I, you know, I had a girlfriend in college who was from there, and we stayed in touch, and then I decided to visit her. Um, this is maybe 2000, and we hit it off again. So that was how your your connection That's to South Africa. Connection. Okay, South I was Africa. like, how man? It sounds like you've been all over the yeah, place. Yeah, she, she, she was from there. So we, I visited, and man, it's such a beautiful town, and the people are so amazing, and the economy is such that like, you, as a bur- as a bartender, you're a b- living life like a banker down there, you know. Yeah. And I had about twenty thousand dollars saved up to open up a bar in New Orleans, but I was. Short by maybe $2 million, right? Sure, yeah. But then I got to Cape Town. I was like, God damn. I'm, I could do it here. I could do it here. Yeah, okay. So I thought I'd surprise her, said my goodbyes, went home, worked Jazz Fest, came back with another 5000 so By the time I came back, she had a boyfriend. So I was like, God damn it. That's not going to happen. But I'd already packed up all my things. Yeah. So I'm like, well, I'm here. So let me just try I'm going it. to Cape let Town. Me, let this me is try it, you know? Let's just try it. So yeah. I just started walking up and down the streets, and I saw a for lease sign, called it, signed a lease. Um, my tourist visa expired. I bought some equipment. Uh, there, the liquor license stuff is such that it's not like here where you have to go, you have to have a license to get it. Okay. You every the licensed people and regular people bought it from the same store. The licensed people, I think, didn't pay tax. So, I hired some people. I bought some equipment. I bought some liquor, and I just opened up. I didn't have a business permit. I didn't have a liquor license. I had an expired tourist visa. And you're in Cape Town, South Africa. And I'm in Cape Town. And listen, the place I found was on the biggest, busiest street in town. So like, picture like Five Points, the heart of Five Points. Yeah. There were businesses all over me. It was crazy. So I hired a local guy. Dude, you're wild, man. Was, That's crazy. I, it's hard for me to imagine what how reckless that was. I was like, dude, and I so doing I was, it. I hired a guy who had been bartending down the street who had, had like a lot of friends. He knew a lot of people. He was running the best bar in town. But he got fired because he was a junkie. He was a heroin addict. Oh, okay. He would come in every now and then. He would wear, he would shave off his eyebrows. He would wear blackface some days. One day he had a Hitler mustache on. He was an odd bird. Dude, that sounds like it. Yeah. So, you know, we're just sort of plunking along. And one Friday, he looks up at me. He's reading a book. That's how slow we are. And he goes, have the Nigerians come to see you? 
I'm like, no. And he just goes, they probably just don't know you're here yet. And he goes back to reading his book, and it's, he never explains what that means. Have the Nigerians come to yeah. see you. Okay. So that, Ominous. Or, that night, this is Thursday. So the next night, some guy asked if he could rent my place out. And I'm like, fuck yeah, I could use the cash. He has a fucking thousand people in there. There are people in the streets. They're stopping traffic because there's so many people trying to get in this place, right? Well, the next day, <clears throat> we're in the same position. Leslie was his name. And I'm sitting there, and I was on the second floor. And I look over, and this massive tree of a dude comes up the stairs. He goes, who's the owner? And I'm going, I am. And he hands me a business card. And he goes, they'd like to speak to you. And he just walks off. And I look at Leslie, and he goes, they know you're here now. <laughs> they know you're here. And it was a company called Pro Access Security. I go to this place on the, on the Monday. I go into the office. There's a table set up. There's this white South African guy. He's also a giant dude. He's a refrigerator. Thick South African accent. There are six giant black dudes just standing there quietly. And he goes, you know, Cape Town's a very dangerous place. I don't know much about Cape Town. I can't say I've it spent was, a lot of listen, time there. It's yeah. the most, when I went there, it was the most dangerous country in the world that is not currently at war. Okay. Uh, their nickname for it was Rape it's Town. It's heavy, dude. The, their nickname for it was Rape Town. Rape it is Town. a dangerous place. But anyway, he tells me that, and I'm so stupid, I don't realize that he's talking about him. He's the dangerous person. And I just said, I think I'm good. I don't really need security at this place. It's, I'm not that busy. So I left. And just total naive, like no like idea a, what's going like on. Like an idiot, like a like a like a Seth Rogen character, you know, just dumbass coming out yeah. of it. And I got up, shook his hand, and left. And I bet those giant dudes who were just st standing forward, literally like a military, must have sort of like looked at each other, like, "Is that the stupidest person you've ever seen?" So, like a couple days later, I'm at my place. There's a pool table in the back, and the big white guy and one giant black guy come in, and he goes, "Is, is there some place we can talk?" And I go, "Sure, let's go to the back." And as I walk in, there's two dudes playing pool, two local guys. And before I can ask them if we can have the room up, the one guy playing pool looks up, looks over my shoulder. He puts down his pool cue and just walks silently out the, the room. And I'm like, that was weird. But then I look at the dudes again, and I'm suddenly seeing these dudes through his eyes, the dude that left. And I was like, fuck me. These are actual mob people. These are the Nigerians. Um, and I just said to him, I'm like, you know what, never mind. Let's go ahead and p figure it out. And so he goes, I think that's a wise decision. And then from then on, every month, uh, a giant dude would come and get an envelope. You just had a payment to him, I had a payment to, to him for your month. security. But here's the crazy thing. Paying the mob kept the cops out of there. Paying the mob meant I never needed a liquor license. I never needed a business permit. I never needed a, a visa on my passport. So that's how it rolls. That's how it rolled. And like... I was, again, just so stupid and naive that three years later, when I, like, I wasn't quite as busy and more bars had opened up and I was getting kind of slow, I'm like, what can I do to, what can I cut? I'm going to cut paying the mob. So when the guy came in to get his envelope, I said, I don't have anything for you. And the next day, the cops were in my place. The, the, of course that's the case, right? The mob yeah. doesn't get their hands dirty. Yeah, they, they just, just called up the police and, the and the like, yeah, yeah, go, yeah. go arrest this guy. They asked me for my liquor license. And I didn't have it, so they shut me down. So that was it? No, it wasn't. Oh, okay. And by that point, I had a friend who had a bar. And we went away for the weekend, and he goes, I've got a liquor license. And I had a buddy of mine who worked at, like, the Kinko's down the street. He goes, we could photocopy, we could scan his what? liquor license. We could Photoshop off his name and his address and put on your name and address. I'm like, let's do it. So we did it. I hung it up. I opened my doors. Ten minutes later, the cops were in my place. They're like, can we see your liquor license? And I pulled it off the wall, and I gave it to them. And they're like, hmm, looks good. And I put it back up, and I was good. And I was like, I have just outsmarted the mob and the cops. And we traded for like another three weeks. And then one of the waitresses comes up and goes, uh, Faisal, the cops are here. I go, well, how many of them are here? And she goes, I think all of them. All of, all, of them. all of them. All the South African police them. are here. And like I look, out of, I look out of the window at the street and all the buildings are lit up with blue and red sirens, sirens you know, the, the lights. Yeah. And I'm like, hmm. And I see a bunch of blue, uh, blue uniform cops, which I've seen before, but then some black uniform cops show up. And uh, they – Hey, well, let me see that liquor I'm license like, again. I pull off the liquor license. They're like, we're not here for that. We're here for you. 
And then this guy pulled out like a little file folder that had all my flights in and out of Cape Town. And he goes, see this flight right here? You weren't on it. And it was like three years ago. Yeah. And he goes, can I see your passport? I'm like, it's at my house. He goes, let's go for a ride. And they put me in cuffs and they took me out. We went and got my passport. And of course, that had an expired tourist visa. And then I went to fucking jail. <sighs> yeah. And it was funny because they didn't shut down the bar. So like the next night, uh, like during visiting hours, like the staff would come and tell me like what numbers we did, you know? But meanwhile, I was in jail. Jail in South Africa? What? Yeah. There's some, like the concrete little area where, they, where I had visitation had a sign up on the wall that said, please keep this area clean. Somebody had smashed somebody's face up against the wall and drug it across the wall, across the sign that said, please keep this area clean. Oh, God. That's like, something out of a movie. And there, it was listen, terrifying. There was, a poli- there, was a TV, um, uh, there was a TV behind the counter at the police station. It was in a cage. Like, wouldn't that be the safest TV in Cape Town right now? It's behind the counter where the cops are. What's going to happen to it? So they were, like, asking me, like, are you okay in there? I'm like, can we see the sign that has blood on it? Just get me out of here. Just get me the fuck out of here. Yeah. So at that point, I was dating a a German filmmaker, and she surrendered her passport, which allowed me out of jail. Like, kind of like on bond? On bond. So I had to check in every day to make sure that I didn't leave for, like, Namibia or Zimbabwe. Um, that I would, in fact, get on the plane that I was... So they were basically kicking you out of the country. They kicked me out of it. I never saw my bar again. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. A little but, tidbit. I mean, That's crazy. It was a very interesting... So was that story. the first time you had owned a bar? Technically, I did not Te- own anything. Technically not, yeah. but... But that you, was my, but that was my You would call story. it your bar, the, yeah. It, That's pa- pretty cool, a little backstory. Airplanes, paper yeah. airplanes hung in that bar. Yeah. Um, there was a periodic table in that bar. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. And Any was, pictures of that bar? Yeah, I have plenty of them. Yeah, yeah oh, yeah. man. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. It was it was pretty outrageous because I didn't have a liquor license. The mob was protecting me. And uh, Cape Town was a pretty big cocaine town. So every day, you know, on, on top of, like, cutting lemons and, like, putting ice in the well, the bar staff had to put fresh cocaine straws in the bathroom because we had mirrors and cocaine straws, fresh ones. Just normal. Just normal. Just normal. You know, as a courtesy. Day-to-day as courtesy. A cur- as a yeah. courtesy. And I remember seeing Dude, people come in wild, and like showing people, like, I'm not kidding you right now. There are cocaine straws and mirrors in this bathroom. And it's something we could do because we were living so outside the law that we could do anything. It was really crazy. So you didn't need cocaine straws and mirrors for the atomic? I guess, yeah. Well, we were living within the law. Right? Within, yeah. Oh, so, that's cool. Yeah. That's, that's the downside. Yeah. Man, that is wild. Well, uh I wish you all the best in the future. Yeah. I really do. And I think um, it's going to be awesome to see what you get into next. And uh, yeah. we'll have you back on, man. Thank you so much for taking the time to come and, yeah, come and talk it. with this us, is man. Great. This is I cool. Had, this is it's very cathartic to yeah. have this conversation, especially after we just closed that bar. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, I know it's probably been a roller coaster for a week. So, yeah, get some rest. Um, take a break. Yeah. Forget that tropical storm, man. Don't worry about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. That'd be tough. <laughs>